Welcome to part three of the online training program on adaptive designs and clinical trial simulation. Our main goal in this module is to take a closer look at an important class of adaptive designs that utilize response adaptive randomization or a dynamic data-driven randomization approach and are used in proof of concept or phase two trials. We will first go over key features of adaptive designs that utilize adaptive randomization. This will allow us to dig a little bit deeper and discuss key underlying principles and considerations in the world of response adaptive designs. For the purposes of motivation and illustration, we're going to refer to a case study, a response adaptive design applied to a phase two major depressive disorder trial. It is actually the same case study that was introduced in part one. Let's begin with the general goals and benefits of response adaptive designs. They are presented on the slides and uh, we went over those goals back in part one when I first introduced the concept of dynamic data-driven randomization. This is mainly to refresh your memory and to remind you of the important fact that trials with response adaptive randomization are aimed at modifying the randomization scheme, the randomization probabilities used on the data available at the time of an interim analysis. All of the cumulative data are used to support the decision to update the randomization scheme. And the ultimate goal is to increase the probability of assigning better performing therapies. The general goals for that randomization are shown towards the bottom of the slide. Using the adaptive randomization approach enables clinical trial sponsors to treat the patients in the trial as effectively as possible because once again, most patients will receive the most effective treatments. And from a statistical perspective, it is important to point out that by using dynamic response adaptive randomization, we could potentially improve statistical inferences and the precision for the estimates of the treatment effects at the most, most effective treatments or dosing regimens. It would be helpful to mention that response adaptive trials have been around for a while and uh, multiple statistical methods for designing these trials have been developed, have been proposed in the literature. In this module, we will introduce a particular method that looks more attractive in a dose finding setting where we have multiple dosing regimens, for example, multiple dose levels of an experimental treatment compared to a common control. And therefore, it is important to model the dose response relationship. It is just uh, this setting reflects my personal experiences with response adaptive randomization. But I would like to point out that multiple alternative approaches, both frequentist and uh, Bayesian approaches to trial design, uh, could support uh, this dynamic adaptive randomization approach, and they have been explored in the literature. And I would like to mention a few resources, a few references that are shown on the slide. For example, you will find a comprehensive overview of the theory of response adaptive designs in a very general setting, not necessarily in the context of those fine trials in the book uh, by uh, Hu and Rosenberger published in 2008. And um, I would like to point out, of course, that it is somewhat theoretical. There are also multiple publications that present the design and the results of uh, uh, trials that use adaptive randomization. And they could be uh, more illuminating because they are more applied and are based on real life trials. And um, in, uh, for this purpose, I think it will be uh, 
important to refer to the ASTIN trial as a seminal clinical trial that helped put response adaptive designs on the map, if you will, at least for the pharmaceutical industry, even though I would like to jump ahead and point out that this trial had a negative outcome. Still, it was a very impactful trial. And uh, by the way, ASTIN is an acronym. It stands for Acute Stroke Therapy by Inhibition of Neutrophils. This was, I would say, a very ambitious exercise. And um, this was um, a trial that utilized a response adaptive randomization approach that was applied to 15 dose levels of an experimental treatment plus placebo. So the total sample size was quite large. Over 900 patients were recruited. Unfortunately, uh, as I said, the compound that was studied in the ASTIN trial did not improve recovery in stroke patients. This was the patient population studied in this trial, and the trial was terminated early due to futility. But conceptually speaking, the trial was a huge success in the sense that it helped the sponsor reliably estimate the dose response for this compound. It quickly led to an informed decision to stop the trial. And um, the Aston trial, if you step back and look at its impact, this Aston trial inspired dozens of other sponsors and research teams to pursue similar adaptive randomization approaches in their trials. This slide provides background information on the case study that was originally defined in part one it will be used to illustrate adaptive randomization rules in uh, a dose-finding setting. Again, to remind you that this was a phase to trial in patients with partial responsive major depressive disorder. Uh, it's a five-arm trial. There are four doses of an experimental treatment versus placebo. The primary endpoint is a continuous endpoint. And um, it is something that is very commonly used in major depressive disorder trials. It's a total score, so-called MADRAS, total score, which stands for Montgomery Asbrook Depression Rating Scale. And um, I will add here very quickly that in major depressive disorder trials, it is standard to measure a patient's response to treatment only a few weeks after randomization, uh, four or six weeks after randomization. In this particular case, the response, an early response, fairly early on onset of action was anticipated, and the primary efficacy endpoint was defined as the change from baseline in this total score to the end of the four-week treatment period. A multi-stage design was utilized in the study with interim, pretty frequent interim looks. And those interim analyses were used to update the randomization ratio in a dynamic and uh, data-driven fashion. Here's additional information on this study. Here we're describing the sample size in the trial as far as the information on the anticipated patient enrollment pattern. The length of the patient enrollment period is uh, set at uh, 36 weeks, and about 5% of the patients, assuming a uniform dropout distribution, are expected to drop out of the study prior to completing the four-week uh, treatment period. And uh, the reason we're spending uh, uh, so much time here on defining uh, uh, parameters of the patient enrollment process is because as I pointed out before in part one, it is important to examine the impact of patient enrollment on key properties of uh, adaptive designs, especially multi-stage designs as, as this one. Because one, pa one problem with uh, fast patient recruitment is that adaptation cannot take place efficiently and if the length of the treatment period is not short enough compared to the overall length of the patient enrollment period, it would be better to switch to an intermediate point, some kind of a surrogate endpoint that can be measured fairly quickly after randomization. We will come back to this set of considerations in a few slides, and we'll talk about the so-called pipeline patients and how they impact 
general performance of adaptive trials. And finally, the last point I would like to make on the slide is that the total number of enrolled patients here is set to 200 patients, accounting for the anticipated 5% dropout rate. That gives us about 190 evaluable patients, that is the patients who will complete the treatment period. And we will assume a four-stage design so that 50 patients will be enrolled in the study in each, within, within each stage. We're now ready for a more detailed discussion of the statistical rules that are used in a response adaptive setting. But before we begin digging deeper, I would like to make a general important comment. I think it will be instructive for us to compare and contrast the design and analysis stage of a clinical trial. This is an important dichotomy in uh, all of clinical trials. And I'd like to spend a couple of minutes on this topic to make sure that we're all on the same page and we understand the impact of those of this dichotomy in the context of adaptive designs. Beginning with the design stage, when we design complex clinical trials, it is quite common to run simulations to understand operating characteristics of relevant trial designs. For example, in this case, we would be interested in assessing operating characteristics of a response adaptive design. And in addition to this, we may be interested in examining operating characteristics of certain analysis methods. For example, there could be several methods for assessing the shape and the significance of the dose-response relationship in a dose-finding trial, such as uh, a trial that is considered in this, um, uh, in, this, in this case, in this case study. And another example would be a method for estimating the target dose that corresponds to a certain clinically relevant improvement over placebo. What is important for us to keep in mind is that those analysis methods could be applied to any design, a traditional design with a fixed randomization scheme or a more advanced adaptive design with a dynamic randomization. And in this module, we're focusing on operating characteristics of an adaptive design and the assessment of analysis methods that could be applied in this trial in the context of the step design would be beyond the scope of this discussion. I know this was a longer comment. Now let's take a look at the diagram presented on this slide. This diagram describes a multi-stage design that will be employed in this trial. In the first stage, patients will be randomly assigned to receive placebo or a dose of the experimental treatment using an equal randomization approach. This is a feature of virtually all response adaptive designs. And then at the end of the first stage of the first cohort of patients, an unblinded interim analysis will be conducted. And this would apply, of course, at the end of each other stage. And the available efficacy data will be examined to model the dose response function and uh, evaluate the efficacy profile of each individual dose compared to placebo. And the information on the strength of the efficacy signal, on the magnitude of the treatment difference compared to placebo in each dosing arm will be used to update the randomization ratios, the randomization probabilities for the next stage with the ultimate goal of treating most patients, making sure that most patients will receive the most promising doses in the trial. Let us quickly introduce some mathematical notation that will be helpful or will be required to define key features of trials with adaptive randomization. In this case, as we said, we assume a five-arm trial with uh, a placebo arm and uh, four doses of the experimental treatment. Those doses will be denoted by D1, D2, D3, and D4 and they correspond to the predefined dose levels of 100 milligrams, 200, 400, and finally 800 milligrams. 
the true mean effects will be computed for each dose relative to uh, placebo and those true mean changes for each individual arm be even before comparing them to placebo would be defined based on the mean change from placebo to the end of the four week period in the madras total score which is the primary efficacy endpoint the mean changes will be denoted by mu zero which corresponds to the placebo arm and mu one through mu four will denote the true mean changes in in the in the four treatment arms the randomization ratios will be denoted as shown at the bottom of the slide by r0 and then r1 through r4 the randomization ratio in the placebo arm will be fixed in this five arm design it will be set to 20 percent or 0.2 let me now say a few words about the statistical methodology that will be used in this adaptive design the statistical methodology will take advantage of a model averaging approach and what do i mean by that that's an approach which is aimed at increasing the robustness of dose response modeling in general dose response dose finding trial where there could be a lot of uncertainty about what the dose response function may look like it could be a nice straight line linear dose response relationship it could be a more complex sigmoid curve that has, has uh, an s-shaped curve it could be something else in that case what would be the best way to deal with this uncertainty and uh, ensure that we will accurately estimate the dose response relationship in the trial well the key idea behind model averaging is to begin with a set of dose response models that are quite distinct they describe different shapes of the dose response function for example in this particular case we could assume that uh, the candidate models include a linear model an emax model an exponential model and a uh, logistic model each one of those models would then be fitted to the dose response data at the end of each stage and then predictions made by the individual dose response models will be averaged with appropriate weights and experience shows that this approach results in a robust estimate or set of estimates of the underlying dose response function the resulting estimates will be used then to identify the doses that are more effective and then less effective and it will ultimately drive decisions to update the patient randomization scheme for the next uh, stage of the trial and this model averaging approach as we see on the slide will be implemented using the mcp mod methodology and here mcp mod stands for multiple comparisons and modeling and this framework enables efficient approaches to model-based analysis in phase two proof of concept dose finding studies where there is typically much uncertainty about the shape of the true underlying dose response relationship and an important point here is that the mcp mod methodology for those finding clinical trials has become very popular uh, since uh, the publication of the qualification opinions by the european uh, medicines agency and then by the u.s food and drug administration the regulatory agency said that this methodology is an important tool in the toolbox of the well-informed drug developer and i really like this phrase the well-informed drug developer we could say in general well-informed clinical trial researcher and um, this is the reason why this methodology is uh, very popular in the analysis of uh, those finding uh, clinical trials and it will be utilized in the response adaptive design that will be considered in this module and a little bit of mathematical notation we will uh, denote by fl as a function of di and theta l would be the uh, 
dose response model. Here at DI, as we said a few slides back, uh, denotes the dose. Uh, D0 would be would correspond to the placebo arm, and theta L would be the vector of model specific parameters. The linear model has two different parameters: the intercept and the slope, and more complex nonlinear models would have more parameters. The Emacs and exponential models have three parameters. The logistic model has uh, four different parameters that describes the complex shape of the um, assumed dose-response relationship. And using this dose-response model, the mean effect at each dose will be predicted. Here I'm going to walk you through a numerical example that will help us understand how the decision rules are set up, how they work in this adaptive trial, as well as the underlying statistical methods. We will rely, I'm jumping ahead here a little bit, I will rely on a Bayesian uh, statistical framework, a Bayesian analysis that will account for multiple sources of uncertainty, specifically the uncertainty associated with predicting the mean effects at uh, the end of the trial from the interim outcomes in an appropriate way. This particular plot uh, shows us the results. Uh, obviously, this is a hypothetical example. The results available at the interim analysis at the end of stage one. Here, as we said, an equal randomization approach was used with 10 patients per trial arm. And um, the results, uh, are which the, those mean changes from baseline in the matters uh, total score, are represented on this plot by the black dots um, uh, with the, and as well as associated 95% confidence intervals. And our goal here is to find the way to reliably estimate the underlying dose response relationship because it will ultimately inform the process of updating the randomization ratios for the next stage of the trial. As the first step, we're going to fit the four predefined dose response models to the data collected in stage one. Again, the individual dose, uh, dose response models are linear, Emax, exponential, and logistic model. And if you follow the blue curve shown in this figure, you may be able to tell which one is a linear curve. Um, it's obviously, it's going to be a straight line linear relationship. And this S-shaped sigmoid type curve corresponds to the logistic regression. Now, if you take a closer look at those blue curves, you'll notice that none of them really does a very good job of um, uh, approximating the black dots, the estimated mean effects across the five trial arms. And that's exactly the reason why we prefer to rely on model averaging. So what we do here is we use a pre-specified model selection criterion, for example, the AIC or the Akaiki information criterion. We compute the weights, the model-specific weights. Those weights correspond to the goodness of fit, how well each individual model uh, fits the dose-response data. And if a certain model does a fairly poor job, then it will be assigned a fairly low weight, it will be downweighted, and the better performing model will receive a larger weight. Then we combine the four individual dose response models with those weights, and that gives us the red curve shown in this figure. This is once again a weighted average of the original four dose response models. And based on this red curve, um, we compute the we compute the red dots. These are the predictions at across the four dose levels as well as placebo in this uh, trial. And those red dots represent the predicted mean effects at each dose. And you will notice that those predicted mean effects, based on the model averaging approach, on average do a better job of describing approximating the true underlying dose-response relationship than the individual dose-response models that are represented by the blue curves. As the next step, those predicted mean effects 
that was shown as the red dots on the previous slide. They are used to compute the posterior probability of achieving the target efficacy compared to placebo, which is represented by, uh, by this probability. What we would like to do here is we'd like to make sure that the ideal dose of the experimental treatment here provides a pre-specified amount of improvement over placebo. The target for that clinically, for the most meaningful um, uh, threshold that defines a clinically meaningful effect, uh, corresponds to six points on the matters total score scale. And we use the predicted mean effects um, with the uh, Bayesian twist, if you will, to compute the posterior probability that the mean effect at each dose exceeds the placebo effect by six points. The resulting posterior probabilities of target efficacy are shown in this figure. As you can see, the range from 44.6% at the lowest dose up to 74.7% at the highest dose. These posterior probabilities will now be used to update the randomization probabilities for the next stage to, again, as we said, help accomplish the main goal of adaptive designs that utilize response adaptive approach, which is to, at the next stage, assign most patients to the doses that are clearly provide more improvement over placebo. For example, the doses three and four as opposed to doses one and two. The process of computing the updated randomization ratios for stage two is shown on this slide. We see the formula that helps us take the posterior probabilities computed on the previous slide and uh, derive the R values. Again, R0 here corresponds to the fixed randomization ratio in the placebo arm. It is fixed at 20%. And using that, the remaining, the uh, uh, randomization probabilities for the remaining arms is computed. And this process is controlled by the row parameter, which is the balance parameter. It's the parameter that controls the degree of balance for adaptive randomization. If this, if this balance parameter is set to zero, then we end up with a perfectly balanced allocation, such as was used in stage one. This is not what we would like to hear uh, to do here. We'd like to avoid this extreme case. Therefore, we may try larger values of this parameter, and with larger values of rho, the patient allocation will be increasingly imbalanced. This particular figure shows the updated randomization ratios that are computed when this balance parameter rho is set to one. And the next slide shows what happens when the balance parameter is increased to two. We can see here that we see more diversity in terms of the uh, randomization probabilities. We can see here that while the placebo randomization probability is fixed at 20%, now, across the dose range for the experimental treatment, the randomization probabilities range from 10.2% at the lowest dose up to 28.5% at the highest dose. So we can see here that the row parameter tells the adaptive decision rules how sensitive they should be to the dose response data available at the end of stage one. And if we set the row parameter to two, we clearly end up with a more extreme case compared to what we saw on the previous slide. We are now ready for a summary. Here's a table that is probably worth a thousand words. Uh, the reason I'm saying this is because this table shows clearly the benefits of applying adaptive dynamic randomization rules in this trial we can see in this table the number of patients assigned to each of the five trial arms across the stages. Uh, of course, we we'll begin with an equal randomization approach in stage one, and then the number of uh, patients is updated in stages two, three, and four based on the cumulative efficacy data.
cumulative doses pounds relationship available at the most recent interim analysis and as you would have expected you see that as the uh, trial progresses through the stages the dose response information accrues and uh, as a result when we update the randomization schemes at the end of stages one two and three we see that the randomization scheme ends up favoring more effective doses such as doses three and four and there's clearly a lower chance of assigning patients in the next stage to doses one and two because those are much less effective compared to doses three and four we are done with this uh, quick numerical example uh, this was a, a general overview of the statistical methodology used in the proposed uh, response adaptive design for the clinical trial in patients with major depressive disorder and it will be helpful also now to go back to an important issue that affects virtually all of multi-stage adaptive designs with several interim assessments i'm talking here about the role of patient enrollment in a general adaptive setting i've i've alluded to this multiple times before that a potential problem with fast patient recruitment in an adaptive trial is that adaptation cannot take place efficiently and for this reason it is uh, very important i would say almost critical to keep track of the number of patients in each stage and keep track of the so-called pipeline patients and uh, you would hear this term in discussions related to adaptive trials and um, we have a formal definition for pi pipeline patients uh, shown on the slide when we, when we talk about pipeline patients, we mean patients who are enrolled in an adaptive trial between the end of a stage where the randomization scheme should have been instantaneously updated. But it does not happen. We actually have to wait. We have to wait until all of the patients in that uh, uh, stage complete the four-week treatment period. So we have to wait until the actual time when the randomization scheme is updated. And uh, during that time, additional patients are enrolled. Those additional pipeline patients follow the old randomization scheme from the current stage instead of instantaneously switching to uh, the new stage. And if we end up with too many pipeline patients, it's going to create a blunting effect. It's going to negatively affect the performance of the adaptive design so the adaptation would not be as efficient as it could have been in an ideal world without pipeline patients and i think it would be very instructive to review the following example uh, this is a example just kind of a hypothetical example that shows us what could happen in a multi-stage uh, clinical trial this example, this figure shows us on the horizontal uh, scale the time in weeks from the start of the study and on the vertical case the number of patients uh, either enrolled in the study or evaluable patients. The yellow curve here corresponds to the number of enrolled patients. It uh, keeps climbing of course until we achieve the predefined number of enrolled patients and the red curve corresponds to the number of evaluable patients those who do not drop out of the study they complete the predefined four week period and as you can see here that the maximum number of enrolled patients is less than the number of sorry the, the maximum number of available patients is less than the number of enrolled patients that's due to patient dropout uh, we uh, have built in a five percent dropout rate in the trial design the number of enrolled patients per stage would be 50 and uh, after we account for potential patient uh, attrition potential patient dropout we end up with about 45 patients per stage which means that the first interim analysis at the end of stage one will be held after the 45th patient completes the four week treatment period and that happens in this particular case at about 13 weeks 13.3 uh, weeks to be exact and we can draw a vertical line that corresponds to this uh, important milestone 
Now, what can we say about the number of enrolled patients? If we now extend, if we now follow this vertical line and see where it crosses the yellow curve, which again represents the number of enrolled patients, we'll see that 65 patients in this particular case are expected to be enrolled by that time. So instead of um, having just 45 patients in the first stage, the actual size of the first stage is going to be 65 patients, which will be which will give us 20 pipeline patients. So we end up with 20 pipeline patients in stage one, which is approaching, roughly speaking, about 50% of the number of patients in the first stage of the trial. Ideally, we would have wanted those 20 patients to switch to the new randomization scheme for the second stage, which is optimized to take into account the responses that we saw in the first stage. But in reality, those 20 pipeline patients would still follow the original equal randomization scheme. And the main consequences of this is that fewer patients than expected would be assigned to the most effective doses in the second stage and generally in, in, in this trial. And that's why it's important for us to keep this in mind when we review summaries of operating characteristics for adaptive designs in this class. And um, another quick comment I would like to make here is that, of course, in reality, patient enrollment typically ramps up during the trial in the sense that we typically begin with slow enrollment and then enrollment begins accelerating and the highest enrollment rate would be typically observed towards the end of the enrollment period. Here, just for the sake of simplicity, just for the sake of illustration, I assume that patients are enrolled into the trial in a uniform fashion. And that's why you see the simple linear enrollment pattern. It is generally unlikely. And that's why when we get to the discussion of sample size uh, simulation, it is generally unlikely that you will see this patient enrollment pattern in a real life clinical trial. That's why when we get to the discussion of software tools for clinical trial simulation for this class of adaptive studies, as well as other more general classes of adaptive trials, we will make sure to choose a patient enrollment pattern that is likely to be uh, plausible, uh, uh, consistent with historical data, as opposed to making a simplistic assumption of uniform patient enrollment. We are done with an overview of statistical methodology and key statistical considerations for the class of adaptive designs with data-driven dynamic randomization schemes. The next step, which will be part four, will introduce the software tools that enable efficient clinical trial simulation for this class of adaptive designs. I would like to thank you for your interest in this online training course. Please watch the other videos in this program and please share information on this training course with your colleagues.